So here we have a laser that is cleaned up by going through a spatial filter, and then it goes to the shank cube interferometer, which is a beam splitter that reflects the light this way, and then the curved surface reflects approximately 4% back, and it comes to a focus right outside the shank cube interferometer. Then the rest of the light that gets transmitted will be reflected off of the surfaces that, are we, that we are testing. In the case of a mirror, we will have one surface. In the case of a lens, we will have two surfaces. And this light will also come to focus directly outside of the shank cube interferometer on this side. And the point is to line these up so that they interfere on the ground glass or the viewing screen. Here you can see our best attempt at getting a null fringe with the shank cube interferometer. So when we get near the null fringe, it becomes very sensitive and simply brushing the knobs can change it significantly. In previous labs, we used shear interferometers to measure the wave front error difference function. However, the shack cube interferometer measures the direct uh, wave front error by comparing a reference wave with an aberrated wave front. So our shack cube interferometer has this polarizing beam splitter. Our incoming beam splits here, reflects this way. It hits this concave lens. Now about 4% of the light is reflected towards our viewing screen. That's our reference wave front with no aberrations. The rest of the light passes through the lens. It hits our test component, which could be a lens or a mirror. And then it comes back through the lens, through the polarizing beam splitter, and interferes with our reference wave front on the viewing screen. Now for the test component, if it's a mirror, that means a lot of light is going to come back here, and the reference wave front will be much dimmer than the aberrated wave front. So you need to use a linear polarizer or something else to attenuate the beam over here in order to get maximum contrast. When you have a lens over here, again, only about 4% will reflect, so it'll be fairly dim as well, and about equal to the reference wave front. So our interferogram with the shack cube interferometer, for a perfect lens with no aberrations, no tilt, no defocus, you should see just a null fringe, just an even fringe. Uh, with the perfect lens with just tilt, we'll see these vertical fringes. That's tilt about the x-axis. You can see the axes here are defined. So it's even parallel straight fringes. And then for a perfect lens with just defocus, you get concentric circles. With defocus and tilt, the, the circle center is going to be off to the side. And we'll have circular lines as well. Our interferograms with spherical aberration with no tilt and no defocus looks different depending, or with defocus, depending on where you are, looks different depending on the focus. At paraxial, this is what you have at medium focus. You've got this sort of pattern, and at marginal, you've got this sort of pattern. So using these interferograms, we can count fringes and look at the locations of the fringes along the y-axis and along the x-axis. And by counting fringes, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, so it flips direction when you hit the zero fringe. We can use that, use the least squares fitting method, and use equations to derive the amount of uh, wavefront or the amount of different aberrations that are present in the lens or mirror. So for the least squares fitting method, we plot the fringe order versus the normalized fringe position. We get a series of points. Then we do a polyfit with a third order polynomial, and we do this on both the x-axis and the y-axis. And we can find these coefficients ANs and BNs. And we use those to find the different aberrations. So we've got spherical, x and y coma, x and y tilt, x and y astigmatism, and defocus. So now we're going to talk about our results. You can see from these pictures that we have our null fringe, which is supposed to be the absence of aberration at the focus of the optical element that you're testing. And then we also have our defocus and tilt interferograms. It was impossible for us to get purely defocus or purely tilt because applying defocus resulted in a major amount of tilt due to the non-axial alignment of the system and the tip tilt had such a major crosstalk that you could you get tilt in both directions regardless of which way you turned it. So you can see that the centroid is essentially out of the picture and that all we're seeing here is mostly tilt fringes because there's a lot of tilt. Next you can see our results for the lens. The lens was much more difficult to work with and although we did get better fringe quality from it. So you can see our approximate null fringe which is not exactly a null fringe because of spherical aberration um, and then you can see our small defocus with a negligible tilt, so you can see that the uh, the null fringe has gotten smaller and it looks more like a defocus interferogram. We also calculated the uh, coefficients of aberration for this using our analysis code, and you can see that there's a lot of defocus, a little bit of spherical, uh, some tilt, and this must be a, an oddity, but the there is a lot of astigmatism, which must be because there was very few data points. And finally, uh, you can see our tilt and defocus interferogram with very high contrast fringes down below. Finally, it's important that we talk about what we should have seen. So with both the mirror and the lens, we should have seen, with only defocus, these c circular fringes with a null fringe that has no fringe content. And then with tilt, you would see linear fringes if it's in the x-direction, like that, in, that would be perpendicular to that axis, with, again, a just a null with no aberration content. And finally, if you have tilt and defocus, you have circular fringes that are offset. But unfortunately, we also have spherical aberration in both of our elements, so we cannot get a perfect null fringe.